communication consulting firm. They work with companies to help their team and their executives with both internal and external communications. Prior to joining Speakeasy in 1994, Weiss served for 10 years for TBS as Executive Vice President in charge of satellite distribution. Weiss is the founder and chairman emeritus of the T. Howard Foundation, a Washington, D.C. nonprofit that promotes diversity in uh, broadcast and electronic media. He served as an Emmy voting member of the Academy of Television Arts and Science for 25 years. He is currently a board member of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. He's a champion for authentic leadership by advocating honesty and transparency. He was awarded a gold medal by Axiom Business Books for his book, Dare, Accepting the Challenge of Trusting Leadership. Please welcome to the stage, Scott. Spoken communication is where trust lives. 
In our short program this morning, we're going to give you some insight on how the way you deliver your messages, your content, creates a trusting perception, a trusting relationship with all of the people that you work with every day. It's critical to Hirsch and Family Entertainment's culture, and it's critical to your business success. I'm going to invite Pavel Husky to join me on stage. Pat is a senior vice president at Speakeasy. She's in charge of our curriculum. She is the dean of our faculty. She's a 30-year communication expert. She graduated with a master's degree in speech and language pathology. She facilitates our most senior workshop at Speakeasy that's for C-suite executives called the Leader's Edge. And she travels around the world private coaching some of the most notable and respectable executives on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, Pat Lusty. Trust. It's a big word. And yet it's built in very small moments over time. And it can be lost. In a single event. You know, you can't pe teach people to trust because inherently it's a feeling that has to be earned. The companies require trust just as much as people do. And it's been said that the emotional experience, the typical customer, is half of how they feel about the company. So let's take Apple for a moment. I saw you giving out an Apple product here. The interesting thing about Apple, they have this huge, loyal fan base. And people have come to expect innovative products from them. But let me ask you something. How many in this room, by a show of hands, have actually read the software license, license agreement on iTunes before you clicked yes? Ah, we have one. My understanding is about 220 pages. So, you know, I cannot say that I have actually read that. And yet, we agreed to something that we have no idea what we're agreeing to. So at some level, we trusted Apple. We made ourselves vulnerable and we said, okay. When we trust, we do make ourselves vulnerable because we're actually allowing someone else's actions to occur around something that we feel is important. So I'm going to ask you guys to sit back for a moment, let yourself be a little bit more vulnerable, and react to some images that I'm going to show you on the screen in just a moment that are either going to generate a sense of trust for you or not. So if you feel like this image generates a sense of trust, raise your hand. If you don't, don't raise your hand. Okay? Well, let's take a look at those now. got everybody raising their hands, some immediately nobody was raising their hands, and some there was that little hesitation. Mm, not sure. So maybe it depends upon life experiences, context, biases. All those things influence the way we feel in the moment, whether we're speaking or whether we're listening. And it's a two-way street. So when we're speaking and we're not comfortable, or when we're speaking and we feel a little threatened, it influences with subtle nuances the kinds of things that we might do. I'm going to show you one more. It engenders an experience of trust. Raise your hand. 
Okay, so a couple. Brian Williams, anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News, one of the most popular and well-respected journalists in the country. Achieved all kinds of journalistic excellence awards, and yet, with one story where he, quote, exaggerated his travels on a military helicopter when he was covering the Iraq war, trust was seriously damaged. And it started with a Facebook post by someone who said he wasn't there. That someone happened to be a military personnel that was on the helicopter that got hit by the rocket propeller grenade. And it started to unravel what had been a very accomplished career. Six months of unpaid leave while an internal investigation went on to decide whether he was going to keep his job or get fired. The decision was to create another role for him on MSNBC, that he was not going to go back to NBC Nightly News. And in this decision, there was a comment made that if we give him a second chance, he will earn back the trust of his colleagues and his viewers. Well, time will tell. Look at what the reaction of this group was when that picture went up. There were a few hands. But I think the thing that's important here to remember is that it doesn't take, in this case, it was a betrayal of content. But in addition to that, the way we say things can create that same sense of betrayal. I'm listening to you, I'm hearing your words, they all sound good. I don't believe it. In organizations where the senior executives say, you know, there's not going to be any layoffs, and the words are what people want to hear, the way in which it was said doesn't really help the workforce believe it. And the rumors start that there's going to be layoffs. <coughs> they sit there and scratch their heads. Why? We told them there wasn't going to be any layoffs. So it's not just the content, as in this case. It's also your delivery, your style. I don't have the right touch on this. OK, so let's talk a little bit about what happens with the choices that we make when we're speaking. What are those subtle nuances that can influence the way someone takes you in? So we're going to put the content aside for now. You ever have somebody violate your personal space? Yeah? Okay, so these guys are pretty close, right? And a networking event is a great place for you to observe this. You know, there's a few smart people that are trying to make really quality connections with people. And then there's the folks that are running all over the room, handing their business card out to everybody who will take one. You will find, if you observe, usually, in a networking event, someone who fits the description of what I call the close talker. You know, they come right up to you. They are ready. And you kind of take a step back, and they come with you. <laughs> and then you kind of take a step over to the side. Again, and you are not listening to anything they are saying because what's going on in your brain is how am I going to get away from this person? There's not much trust in that moment that I even want to be with this person. So in that example, it's just how they're holding their body. Where their body is in space compared to where you as their listener are in space. It starts before you even open your mouth. So in this example, you've got people that are pretty close, and then, you know, notice it's not just hands on his hips, it's a fist on the hip. If we were looking at the whole picture, I suspect it might be like this. So that stance might feel threatening to some people. But to the person who's doing it, if they don't know any better, it may simply be this is what's comfortable. So I always think, it doesn't mean anything. Why do people say that I intimidate them? And that lack of awareness of how some of the subtle nuances, in this case, maybe not so subtle, how the person is standing, is what's getting in the way of the connection. So we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those subtle nuances, and maybe some that aren't so subtle, are. But I want you to keep in mind that it actually starts 
with where you are in space and how you move your body is a part of that. So the qualities of an effective communicator that help build trust start first and foremost, as Scott was just saying, with authenticity. If you come across, well, let me ask you this. I'm sure it never happens with Christian family entertainment, but in other places, have you ever come across someone who's talking about something that you know something about, and nothing they're saying is accurate? And everybody's nodding and believing it and eating it up, and you're sitting there going, they don't know what they're talking about. So their content isn't so effective, but maybe their delivery is. I think that's why we have scammers. They're able to convince people that they're being authentic when in fact they aren't. So being your most authentic self sometimes is really, really hard work. You know, we're human. Stuff gets in our way. Getting comfortable in your own skin and being able to be relaxed, even in those moments when you may not feel so relaxed is critical to your ability to come across authentic. If I got up here and my mic clip broke just before I walked up here or came apart, I don't know if it broke, but it came apart, and I'm kind of fiddling with this and thinking, oh great, now what am I gonna do with it? Okay, I'll just have to stick it in my pocket. That's gonna make me look fat. I don't really wanna do this. If I start thinking about all those things, see how that starts to pull you away from being really present with your listeners? We get distracted in our own heads. What will they think? Will it fall off me now? So the first thing you really want to do to actually come across as authentic as you really are is to settle, to check in with your breathing. Because where does your breathing go when you get nervous, excited, embarrassed, angry, frustrated? Where does it go? It goes up, whoops, goes up here, doesn't it? Moves up high. And when your breathing gets up high in your chest, it's not very effective for speaking. You want it down low and slow. So when you start to feel that little adrenaline rush and it's more than you want, take a pause. Long, slow, steady exhale. And get yourself back if you can, to a place where it feels more comfortable to you. Because part of your ability to come across authentically is that you really look relaxed because you are relaxed, or more relaxed than maybe you feel sometimes. It leaks out of your body if you don't take care of it. You ignore it, you try to muscle through it, we're probably going to see it. We're going to feel it in some way. And remember earlier I said trust is a feeling. So we feel these things that happen when a speaker is speaking that sometimes gives away what they're really experiencing. Your authority and your energy and listener awareness is where the specific choices that you make in your communication make the biggest difference in how authentically you come across. So let's take authority. Again, how you hold your body is a really important part of that. If I came up here and I stood like this, because you know that thing just coming apart really is sort of bothering me. So do I look like I belong up here? Okay, but maybe I'm not even aware of how that's coming across. If I came up and it's like, I'm going to muscle through this. I'm not going to let anybody know. Do I look like I have authority now? Maybe too much. Maybe it's a facade to cover my discomfort. Real authority means you own your comfort. You own your time and you own your space. So coming back to this notion of where is your body, in space and what are you doing with it, take a moment and just think about what are you doing with your body right now? Don't change it. Just think about it. Are you kind of all tight? Are you sprawled out? You know, where are you and what does that feel like? What might that say 
to someone who you were speaking with if you start talking like that. Owning your space, owning your time, don't necessarily go hand in hand. I may own the space, but you know what? I got a lot to say, so I'm going to hurry up and I'm going to get through this and I'm just going to talk a mile a minute because I was supposed to have 30 minutes and I walked into the meeting and you guys cut me to, you didn't by the way, but let's just say this happened, you cut me to, you know, half of the time that I had and so I'm just going to frame everything that I was going to say into the time that you gave me. Anybody ever experienced that at a meeting that you've gone to? It happens all the time. And so your ability to say, I'm not going to let the circumstances drive how I use time because you're going to come across rushed and probably nervous if you do that. Can I pause? And in that pause, collect that next thought. In that pause, my listener gets to digest what I just said, and I get to breathe. And maybe you can accomplish the same thing in a shorter time and leave them wanting more because you really had more. And now perhaps they really want it. All of that contributes to the perception of your authority. What about energy? Energy is conveying conviction. And you know, a lot of times people think that energy is being loud and fast, but it really doesn't have anything to do with that. If you care about something, and when you say it, it could be a great message, but when you say it, it doesn't sound like you care, why should your listeners? <clears throat> and a lot of times they won't. Or if you care deeply about something, and you only say it in a way that sounds like you care a little, you probably shouldn't be surprised if your listeners don't care as much as you wanted them to. But that takes us being a little vulnerable, doesn't it? If I really share how strongly I feel about this, you know, what will you think of me? And all of those kinds of self-critics that we have going on up here can kind of get in our way. Voice is a big part of that. <laughs> if I got up here and I said, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. This is a great um, opportunity, and I hope you enjoy the play. So. Okay? Does it sound like I care? If my body was in a position like this, you know, does it look like I care? So when putting together how you're using your body and your voice, to make sure that you come across with the conviction that you intend to, that's going to increase the energy that helps your listeners believe that what you're saying is something you believe. So here's a little tip for both of those things. When you're standing and you're waiting for the elevator or you're waiting for um, to be seated in a restaurant or even in the grocery store line, Pay a little attention to where your stance is. You want your feet hips width apart, 50-50 weight distribution, and arms just relaxed at your side. It feels weird to people because they're not used to doing it, but you build muscle memory over time. And then when you most need it, you can be still, you can walk with purpose when you want to move, but you're not doing little distracting random steps and you're not getting all off or kind of like these things. I've had them all my life. Now that I'm up here, I don't know what to do with them. So, you know, I have to put them somewhere. And it becomes distracting to your listeners. So being able to really develop a sense of here's a solid stance where you stand your ground and make your point. And then when you move, move with purpose. Because it's not that I'm not moving right now. I'm just not moving my feet right now. But I'm certainly moving my upper body. And that's part of where that engagement comes. So there's the authority piece as an example. The example for the energy, again, use your voice. Your voice can tell your listeners, boy, and can your voice be trained, right? Your voice can tell your listeners how you're really feeling. Anybody ever have somebody say to them, are you okay? And you go, yeah, why? Well, you sound like something's bothering you. Or you sound tired. Sound like you ticked off. And maybe you really were, but you didn't intend for anybody else to know that. So being able to use your voice in a way that matches your intent is also critical to building trust. Does it have a sound of empathy in it? 
Does it sound like you care just because you say you're caring? People can read through that. They feel that sense of sincerity or not. And it usually can result, when it's not there, in people saying, yeah, 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 I know that's what he said, but yeah, don't buy it. So a way to help you think about how you use your voice is to always come back to being conversational. The more conversational you are, the more this stuff happens automatically. It's hard to be conversational if you feel like you're scripted and I can't let go of my notes at all. It pulls us away from having this dialogue with another person. It's perfectly okay to have notes. Look at them. Look back up at someone and have a conversation with them. Because your voice will sound warmer and richer. You'll get a fuller tone, oftentimes without you having to do anything else. But here's a little tip for a specific thing that you can do to make your voice sort of come alive. It's the key point, the takeaway, the thing that you really want people to walk out of that meeting or that room well. Take the key phrase, the key word, elongate it. Really emphasize it. So here's an example. And I'm not going to use my body at all so that you can just get the emphasis from the voice. If we implement recommendation number three, we can increase our market share by 11%. There's the content. And now I'm going to use it with my voice. We implement recommendation number three. We can increase our market share by 11%. So what's the most important part of that message? 11%. It's pretty clear. I didn't even do anything with my body. Let me in my body. If we implement recommendation number three, we can increase our market share by 11%. Okay, now you see where that emphasis is. So your listeners are coming right to where you want them to pay attention. Let's use the same sentence and switch it around. If we implement recommendation number three, we can increase our market share by 11%. What's the most important part now? Number three. And I don't, you know, it's not number two, it's not four, guys. If we just implement three, we're going to be home free next quarter. I told you all of that with no extra words. You use your voice to highlight the important parts. It gives you energy and it gives you credibility. <coughs> Listener awareness. This one is about seeing people. It's about the way you look at another person when you're speaking. You know, in a room that's wide like this, it's very tempting for speakers to kind of scan the room because I want to include all of you, but I'm really not seeing any of you when I do that. It's like a fire hose. When you pick someone out and you direct your eyes right to that person and you give them a thought, and then you let your eyes float to somebody else and you give them a thought. And if the lights on a big venue are shining in your eyes, you sometimes just can see the silhouette. You've got to imagine. But every time you're speaking, you're speaking to a person. When that happens, people feel like you're talking right to them. And it engages us. And we want to listen. And we want to start to build that trust. Maybe not with what the person is saying. You can disagree with the content. But the person who is speaking develops or starts to develop a trustworthiness, oftentimes because of that delivery style. So think about at your next meeting how you're looking at people. Lock in with someone with your eyes first. Make your statement. Or, if it's easier, linger for a second after you finish. And then go on. It kind of cements the idea that makes your message land more solid. It's probably one of the single most important things that as senior leaders you can do when you're, work, when you're talking with your teams. You're busy. You've got to make things happen. And maybe it's a day where you feel the pressure. You've got to walk into this room and you have to make something happen right now. And all of a sudden we kind of let the stress of that and the hurriedness of it take over. We're not really being present with that listener awareness needs to be so strong if you want it to build trust that no matter how big the room is, no matter how small the room is, people will believe that you care that they're there, you would notice if you got up, and they really would care that you would like. 
If you put all of those together, the authority, the energy, the listener awareness, and integrate them, that's when the reaching out to connect really happens. And it's not just a physical reaching out like this to kind of close that space between you and your listeners, but it's really an integration of reaching out with your voice, with your eyes, with your heart that helps build the trust. That again ends up making us sometimes feeling kind of vulnerable and it clearly speaks to the need to be authentic when we're communicating. No matter how hard people work on their content, no matter how hard people work on their style of communication, sometimes the trust is broken. Why? Because we're human. We're human beings and we have egos and we have insecurities and we have flaws and they sometimes get in the way. But our ability to be self-aware and to know that's kind of what's happening right now and to be able to stop, take a pause, regroup, look right at someone and start to have a conversation with them can change some of that when it starts to happen. It's not about us never ever having a situation where someone might doubt. Is there anybody in this room that can honestly say they have never ever in their professional lives been sitting in a meeting, listening to someone and going, I don't believe this person. Is there anybody here? It's rare. But what a, what a wonderful goal to have. A solid, firm handshake is a symbol of trust. You know, people used to shake to make a deal. There wasn't even a lot of legal stuff. If you go back far enough on it, you know, let's shake on it. Do we have a deal? And it symbolized a moment of trust for those two people. To be as good as your word requires that we pay attention to the subtle nuances of our communication. Because those subtle nuances influence the ability of our listeners to trust us just as much as the content that we use. So when you think about that metamor metaphor of a solid handshake. Think about what you're doing when you're communicating, and is that what it's represented? Thank you for your attention. We're going to open this up now for some questions. Scott's going to come back up on the stage and. Oh, sorry, I'm back there. Okay. So, questions about this. Anything that either of us have said or questions that you have about communication situations that you've been in? Yes? Um, I think we all use our hands when we talk. It's just kind of natural. Right. Is there uh, too much? Sure. Is there not enough? Is there Both. <laughs> yeah, so if you're all locked up and contained, it's not enough and it doesn't make you look open and relaxed. And if someone's up here flailing all around, you know, then it can get distracting. So a good happy medium is to start, and this is what people feel is really weird when you first begin, just begin with this neutral stance where your arms are just by your side. Now, as soon as you start talking, you want to lean in and reach out to people. Use descriptive gestures. So let me give you an example. I can do one quick thing here. Everybody on the count of three, and this will probably tell you kind of what I mean, is going to say, I really don't think that's a good idea. Okay? One, two, three. I really don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. Did you hear your voices all kind of collectively punch the word really? Okay. How many of you leaned forward when you did it? A good number of you. It kind of automatically went hand in hand. Try doing that with just your voice. One, two, three. I really don't think that's a good idea. Not quite as effective, but you can do it. Now try doing it just with your body. You're going to punch the word really with your body, but you're not going to punch it with your voice. One, two, three. I really don't think that's a good idea. 
<laughs> it's harder. So sometimes you, your body will lead your voice. So if you get your body, if you have a muscle memory of being kind of tight like this, if you get your body more open and you use more space, it can also have the added impact of getting your voice out there being more lively as well. So yes, you can overdo it. Make your, make your point, use the space, let it go. Make the point again, every once in a while just drop it. It adds a physical punctuation to the end of what you just said. Does that answer? Okay. Just as there are cliches with the way you speak, are there cliches and mannerisms as well that might be off-putting to the Do you have a specific example in mind? Well, I mean, I think of some of our contemporary um, orders, you know, maybe you lip biting or, or thumb jabbing or, you know, um, <laughs> well, it's true, not to be specific, but it might uh, provide a connotation that does not imply that the conversation, for instance, you know, might politicize a non political conversation by you know, using a political a mannerism that might be made quite very well done by a political order. So, what, what's your name? <laughs> So you probably aren't aware of this, but you were doing this. So you have to see yourself, and I would recommend that all of you take out your iPhone at some point in time and put it out, get one of those little tripods, and videotape one of your staff meetings, and discover all the things that you do that potentially compromise your integrity or your trust or the influence you're trying to have. So there are all kinds of nuances as Pat mentioned. That, you know, even though you're really trying to communicate a lot of confidence, you know, sometimes it just doesn't come across that way. So, <laughs> but you don't know you're doing it. You know, and it can happen one on one or one on few or one on many. It doesn't matter. It still creates this trusting or not uh, perception of your listeners. Okay. Yes.